Hey guys, it's Nora Princiati. And I'm Nathan Hubbard. And we're back with another season of Every Single Album. This time, we're talking about one of the best-selling boy bands of all time, One Direction. Their story is a fascinating look at both the commercial and human sides of being a young artist. We'll be breaking down every single One Direction album and then exploring the careers of Harry Styles, Niall Horan, and the rest of the band after their 2015 split, leading up to the release of Harry's new album on May 20th. And we've got some fun new categories, Nora. Including the most swoon-inducing lyrics. And the suckiest ones. The peak moments for each band member and who won the album. We even got a brand new game. So, calling all Directioners, Harry's, and more... Join us on the Every Single Album feed starting April 11th, every Monday and Thursday. On Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. This episode is brought to you by Anytime Fitness. We may talk a whole lot about sports, but when it comes to keeping fit ourselves, there's definitely room for improvement. I hit this point early July. I was just like, I am not in good enough shape. I started trying to walk at least 15,000 steps a day or hiking, or just anything to keep my legs moving. Now it's the end of 2023, I feel great. I had a physical uh, three weeks ago and the guy was like, you're doing great. You're doing better than you were three years ago. I felt great. Whatever your goals are, progress is possible. Thanks to Anytime Fitness. Get a personalized plan and support from an expert coach anytime, anywhere. Visit anytimefitness.com to try Anytime Fitness for free. Start to train for your Life, terms, conditions, and restrictions apply. See website for details. This episode is brought to you by Read, Write, Own, Building the Next Era of the Internet, a new book from entrepreneur and startup investor, Chris Dixon. If you're listening to this podcast, you know what it's like to be part of a community of fans. You value the people who play, perform, and create for everyone. But what if there are more ways to support them, more ways to be a fan? And what if you had even more ways to connect with the teams, artists, and other creators that you love? even though creators make the internet valuable. How much value do they get for their work? Well, that's mostly up to a few big tech companies. Shouldn't creators get more from the platforms they make successful? More value, but also more say, more control, more ownership? Read, Write, Own explores an alternative future for the internet, one that reclaims control for creators, fans, listeners, and gamers, the people who not only use the internet, but make it useful. Read, Write, Own imagines an internet built by us for us. So order your copy of the book today or learn more at readwriteown.com. I need supports to have to clear the room. Stand up and walk now. Now. Hello and welcome to The Watch. My name is Chris Ryan. I am an editor at TheRinger.com and joining me on the other line, Live from Hollywood Boulevard, where he is begging people not to see Sonic the Hedgehog 2 <laughs> and give Michael Bay a chance. It's Sean Fantasy! Wow, CR. So happy to be back. My favorite pod to watch. What's up? This is the Michael Bay Men's Recovery Project. Thanks for everybody for joining <laughs> us. We're going to talk about severance today. We're going to talk a little bit about dropout. We'll see what else we get to, but I wanted to have Sean on. You know, we have a podcast that's up on the big picture feed. We're doing a little home at home today where we just extol the virtues of this amazing action movie that is in theaters now, albeit, I'm sure, briefly. (laughs) Uh, And on that podcast, Sean and I talked a little bit about Michael Bay's Ambulance, which is uh, the most fun I've had in a movie theater in in years and a delightful action movie. We were like, gosh, you see some of the projections for this in the box office? It doesn't look like it's going to make a lot of money. And, you know, it, it seems like we were in a zone where it was like Lost City was doing pretty well. Some movies are dog did okay you know people are putting up numbers in the box office and then that fucking hedgehog came through and (laughs) ate all the money is that what sonic does no he grabs golden rings but uh, right unfortunately he grabbed the brass ring this weekend from from michael bay and jake gyllenhaal and yaya abdul mateen the second tough beat really a tough beat for for our guys so you're one of the most level-headed people i know so do you look at this and say action movies are dead at the theater unless they're attached to a major franchise yes yeah um I, i mean i think there's probably a variety of factors here i think calling your movie ambulance is just not a good idea and uh You know what people think of when they think of ambulances is people in pain, hurting, or dead. Yeah. And so that's not ideal. I think also Michael Bay, while he is a very important person to you and I, 
does not have the same brand name recognition that, say, Christopher Nolan does. People will not show up just because Michael Bay made a movie. In right. fact, they did not show up to movies like The Island. And so, so there's no guarantee that you're getting a great movie. I think that this is weirdly a word of mouth movie and will qu- very quickly become known as an action classic. I have not encountered a single person who saw this who thought this sucked. Now, right. does it make sense? It does not make sense. No. But it is absolutely thrilling. And it it won't be as good at home, but it's a movie that, I mean, it, it, when is this going to be on Peacock? Like in 10 days? How quickly will it be uh, available I saw that to it the was, public? I thought first, I saw one place where it was like, it'll be on Peacock in 17 days, but I guess that was a joke. I think it goes on Peacock in May. So in May. Okay. Uh, it'll be a couple of weeks. Here's a, just a quick proposal. You and I moved to a small town. Mm-hmm. together we leave our wives um and okay. so far so good <laughs> and we buy a theater a movie theater and okay. all we play is ambulance and when people are like do you guys think that you could play uh the new david fincher film or mm-hmm. you know do you guys think you could maybe do like a pta retrospective it's like nope this is the ambulance theater you guys didn't do didn't recognize its greatness when it was out the first time so now you're stuck with this being the only movie it is does this culminate in like a murder suicide plot? What is the what it, why no, would we I do think that? It, what we do is over the course of like 10 years we see ambulances box office incrementally grow up go up and up and up. I would like to interrogate your premise a little bit. <laughs> if we move to a small town, there's not a lot of people. Why would they keep coming they back? They keep for coming. Ambulance? It's like we take it back to the 80s where people go to back to the future like five times. Um I I uh, okay, yes, I'm in. This is you didn't see this part in the Build Back Better bill. This is right there. Let's get movie podcasters buying small theaters together in small towns and getting repeat business going for Hollywood. It needs Hollywood needs it. America needs it. Isn't it extraordinary that Michael Bay, who was long considered the whore of the multiplex, the person who would do anything to get you to show up and yes. spend money at the box who office, threw Optimus Prime against a skyscraper and was just like, "Peace out, that's a billion dollars." And he literally can't get people to come to one of his best movies. It's, it's a it's a real shame. I mean, Sonic the Hedgehog two haven't seen it. Could be good. I'll be honest. First one, not bad. Wasn't is bad that Jim Carrey's in that? Jim Carrey, yeah, yeah. yeah. He plays uh, he plays Doctor Robotnik. You remember Robotnik from the Sonic game? I I really don't have any strong memories of playing Sonic, honestly. Was that a a Sega Genesis game? game? It was. It was a terrific game. Um, I played some of the sequels as well. I think Knuckles makes an appearance (laughs) in this film. He's voiced by Idris Elba. That's a true story. Oh, I saw him being Idris being like, when they said Sonic, I was like, stop talking, I'm in. Because he was like, I'm such a big gamer. And I was like, I don't know if that's the same thing as Elden Ring, man. It's so funny because that was my exact reaction when you texted me late on Sunday night and said, the, the watch, are you in? <laughs> and you were like, I'm a gamer. I, said, uh, no I have more. a couple of other news items uh, to go through. We'll stay, we'll stay in the world, world of cinema uh, okay. and, and talk about this. You and I are um, two of, of the most renowned experts when it comes to the lore of Jurassic Park. Mm-hmm. Is that Ma- true? Many people come up to me with tears in their eyes and they say, you and Sean, nobody understands the world uh, that Dr. What was his name? What was Richard Attenborough's character's name? Dr. Grant? Dr. Grant. No, that's that's Sam Neill. I, I, I don't know the man's name. This, it's we're, just like, we're starting exactly where we belong. <laughs> yeah. This is exactly When I hear problem. you guys talk, it's like I'm in Costa Rica. Like I'm on and I'm, and I'm seeing T-Rex. Isla Nublar? Yes. So over the weekend, there's another Jurassic Park movie coming. And yep. I, I don't think, I, I think this is a new new level of director bullshit. So I wanted you to throw a Colin Trevorrow quote at you. Wait, there's, before you do that, can I just point out that literally in the outline of this episode, you provided the wrong title of the new Jurassic Park movie? Is it not Dominion? It's Dominion, but you wrote Jurassic Park colon fallen Dominion. How can, <laughs> it, can a Dominion fall? I guess it can. We really, it's remarkable how little we know about the Jurassic Park films. Remarkable. <laughs> There's been 23 of them. I don't know what do you guys want from me. <laughs> so, uh, Sean and I and Andy, we love director bullshit. We love it when somebody is directing Sonic the Hedgehog and is referencing Elaine May movies or whatever. But <laughs> Trevor O, uh, who's had one of the most amazing careers in recent Hollywood history, and if maybe very emblematic of, you know, indie filmmaker, immediately jumps up a level and does Jurassic Park and from there levels up again and gets a Star Wars movie which then gets taken away from him and then not unlike Michael Bay just is like I guess I just make Jurassic Park movies 
Um, and somewhere in there, he made one of the worst movies of all time, right? What was that? He made the movie The Book of Henry yeah, in 2017, right. immediately after Jurassic World. This was a personal film for him. And um, everyone told him it's one of the worst movies ever made. So uh, Colin has been totally uh, Jurassic pilled and mm-hmm. is now giving comments such as this to The Hollywood Reporter. Uh, he was talking about the new, uh, the new villain of this film, a dinosaur called a Gigantosaurus, which may have existed, may not. And when asked about what like sort of characteristics this um, this dinosaur has, he says, "quote I wanted something that felt like the Joker. It just wants to watch the world burn." <laughs> and I just wanted to see if you had any comment. Um, I do. I have a comment. I I can already see the meme. The meme is a picture of the Gigantosaurus, a definitely real dinosaur. And underneath it, it says, I am going to become the Joker. That's it. <laughs> it doesn't say that's the meme. It's got like Gigantosaurus has Laura Dern in its paw. And it's like, why so serious? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, we're through the looking glass, right? I think the Jurassic films in particular have felt like an entertaining but active joke on itself for 10 years. And... The more that they go on, the more ridiculous they seem. They actually have a lot in common, more so with like the Fast and Furious movies. Yeah. Where it's like every time we need to They're ramp so it sincere up. now. Yeah. They're so like, we have to go back and fix. Like they're like so deep into the BD Wong, like genetic engineering part of it now, right? How many times can they just go back to the place where there are terrible monsters? I don't that think they can go back like at all because a like, volcano erupted there. Did, didn't it just. See, now we're doing the thing where you're trying to get me to talk about the plot of the movie and I won't do it with you because I don't know what happened. I don't remember what happened. Um, I will see this movie in movie Of course, theaters. I'll, I just want I'll you go see this movie in movie theaters too. After Ambulance, I'm, I'm like, I'm back in on theaters. I'm back, back in, in on movies and I'm back in on movie theaters. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's really exciting. Once again, we have Michael Bay to thank. I, in some ways, we have Michael Bay to thank for the state of the Jurassic Park franchise. I mean, I think the success yeah. of movies like Transformers is really what pushed a lot of this stuff to the forefront. Uh, the Gigantosaurus, I don't really, I don't know what to say. I mean, that's, I feel like the origins of dinosaur names didn't have anything to do with literal terms in our world. So the idea of just saying like gigantic dinosaur yeah, is sick, a Gigantosaurus. Yeah. yeah, that's what my three-year-old nephew does. You know, he's like, <laughs> Dad, is this a Gigantosaurus? You know, Not like Puntosaurus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I, I don't know. That's that's pretty corny, but um, I will watch the film. Okay. Um. How excited are you for Better Call Saul coming back uh, next week? Two episodes. It's crazy. I mean, my two favorite shows other than Succession over the last five years, I think have been Better Call Saul and Barry. And so the fact that they're both coming back right now is is pretty shocking. I guess the news, there's news trickling out about Better Call Saul, though. Are you, are you fired up? I am. I, I couldn't be more fired up. I, I mean, I, I do find it a little bit sad that Barry saw We Own the City, Outer Range, Tokyo Vice, um, you know, all of these things are like all bunched together. On one hand, you could make the argument that you never don't have a night where you could watch, not watch something. On the other hand, I think it's just much more fun if there's like a little bit more of like everybody tucks in on Sunday night for Barry or for winning time or for whatever. And it, and it, it kind of feels a little bit more I don't know. I guess I'm just old, like I'm just old school that way. I just think that there was like a fun to that part. Whereas like now That's I'm a, like, oh yeah, I forgot Atlanta's up. I guess I'll go watch Atlanta now. Like, I, I I have a very similar feeling. I don't have as much responsibility to this stuff as you do uh, hosting this show, but it does feel homework is not the right word, but I do have assignments, you know, and I have to kind of like fulfill my assignments, and I find myself enjoying them less than I would like to. Although, you know, like I just watched the finale of Super Pumped last night, Mm -hmm. a show that I think, you know, I think I enjoyed in the exact same way that you did, where I I thought it was like a little bit goofy at times, but had that Koppelman and Levine tonality that I think is a lot of fun. And then I think actually weirdly rounded itself into kind of a great finale. And I I really loved the Joseph Gordon-Levitt performance. But I thought as I was watching it last night, I was like, this actually is, has it moved on from something I feel like I have to finish to something I am actively enjoying and thought ended kind of impressively and yeah. elegantly, which um, we don't always get that with our shows. Better Call Saul, though, is in a different stratosphere. That's like legitimately one of the best TV shows of the last decade. So it's pretty amazing that it's coming back for this is the end, right? This is the last season. Uh, yeah, but they're splitting it. So okay. there will be, I think, I think it's seven and seven or something like that. So there's a, a run now. And then I believe there, there the rest of the episodes come up this year. 
maybe later in the year. Um, this is something that's pretty common. Uh, Ozark's doing it right now where Ozark's last uh, first the first seven episodes or six episodes of Ozark's final season were a couple of months ago and now they're about to come out uh, at the end of this month again another show where it's just like okay multi Emmy award winning Ozark is just coming to an end while all these other things are on with Saul I wanted to ask you a little bit so there was a Paley Center uh, panel talk with a lot of the people behind Saul with John Carlos Esposito and Peter Gould and you know Owen Kirk and Seahorn and everybody and at that um, Paley Center talk, Peter Gould was asked whether or not Walton Jesse would make an appearance in Better Call Saul. Pretty straightforward. And he was like, I'm going to say yes. Now, I mean, I, I guess people might be like, don't spoil that for me, but I'm sorry. He said it in a place knowing that it was going to be aggregated into high heaven. And this could be something as simple as in the background of a shot, like waiting outside of Saul's office are Walt and Jesse to go in or something like that. But I thought it was an interesting way of handling kind of like the, this, the sort of uh, the Benedict Cumberbatch is he or is he not con uh, conundrum that sometimes affects movies or shows that are trying to obscure a big twist that's coming up. So obviously Andrew Garfield is a recent example of ha- him having to like go on the tick tick boom promo trail and every single night somebody being like so are you in spider-man like <laughs> uh i guess peter gold was like we're just going to get asked this in every single interview so we might as well just say yes they are and then we can be cheeky about it or it can be an incredibly significant dramatic moment i was a little bit disappointed though just because part of what i love about saul is it's it's distance between the breaking bat like it is very much it's it's part of its world but I think part of the achievement is that it would be a great show even if you had no idea what was coming for this character in a lot of ways. Well, I think that there's some strategy involved here, though. I think it is, you know, the ratings for Saul over the first five seasons have gone down every season. I think the adulation for the show has gone up every yeah. season. But it feels somewhat similar to, it could be somewhat similar to what happened with Breaking Bad which is that the show took a long break between its final season, which I think was also bifurcated. Yep. And the amount of people who caught up with it on streaming basically elevated the show to a different kind of stratosphere in terms of the kind of like cultural awareness and the amount of people that watched it. And this is a show that basically ended right at the beginning. The last season ended right at the beginning of the pandemic. Yeah. So it's been two full years since we've seen it. And I feel like Peter Gould is making a very tactical decision here. To be like, Jesse and Walt are coming, or, or uh, you know, and like they may only be a small part of it. They may be exactly what you said. They may be just figures in the background of an episode. But it's like, hey, you have to watch this. Sure. If you're a Breaking Bad completist, you're going to want to see where this fits in. You know, how that, f- whether or not that that's like too cynical for its own good. I don't, I don't really have an opinion about it. Like, I, I, I think people should watch Better Call Saul. I think it's really, really good. It's honestly it surpassed Breaking Bad for me. I don't know if that's sacrilegious. At, I don't think so. I, I think that they, both shows have struggles early on with like getting you to the point. Like Breaking Bad, I think, starts quicker. It has, you know, a pretty iconic opening uh, pilot episode. Saul, I think, with the earlier Michael McKeon-based seasons is like a different show than it is now that it's basically about Gus and Saul. Um, but yeah, it's... Uh, <laughs> I think the highs of Breaking Bad are higher than the highs of Better Call Saul, but the kind of like the flow of Saul, I have personally enjoyed more. Although I was much more into, I think, those early seasons when I know you and Andy felt like there was a lot of like um, legalese kind of bogging the yeah, show down. Yeah, doc review, yeah. Yeah, um, doc review, right. But um, I mean, I, I hope more people are watching it. I'll be fascinated to see if it gets a spike. Yeah, like, and especially, but this this will be, this Barry Saul like moment is like a real despite the fact that we'll never know because nobody really like understands like what, what ratings are anymore. Like I, I think that it was pretty clear to say euphoria was a huge hit succession did very well, whatever, but like it'll be very interesting to see whether this Netflix bump for Saul people rewatching it, people being like, okay, we're going to, we're here for it. The fact that they're putting up two episodes is interesting. Uh, I, I, I've noticed that pretty much every show does that now. Um, Why do you think that is? Well, so many shows are new. So I think that they are trying to engage audiences as much as possible. So let's say Tokyo Vice put up three episodes, three hours of episodes. That to me is like a, we're going to put these here. 
we're not uh, we're not assuming people are going to watch it the night it's released or the day it's released. What we hope is that people catch up with it over the course of a week or that people find it and then when they find it they've got three episodes to watch. Mm. Um I wonder what the advantage is between I mean 3 is a lot to put up for Saul. I'm kind of like you have built 6 years of behavior around like every episode is perfect. It's going to be strange to watch a Saul episode and then start another Saul episode immediately. Agreed. But maybe they're acknowledging the way that a lot of people have watched Saul, which is like binging it on Netflix. So it seems like the first season is only seven episodes too, which means we're only getting six weeks of Saul and then it's going off the air for a period of time. Yeah, but I think only a couple of months. Like I think it's like a spring and a fall. I think maybe it won't be on there in the summer. I'm not sure when that second half is coming up. Let's talk about a relatively like uh, a show that kind of has some of the buzz around it that I think a lot of these shows that we're discussing now, like this is one of the new shows that I think has really made, um, it's really broken through, but that's Severance, which ended on... um, Friday and Mal and Joe did a really great deep dive into it on the Prestige TV podcast that you can listen to. That went up on Sunday, I believe. But I wanted to talk to you a little bit about it because I know you admired it a lot. I um, did. I think that there was a ton of energy around this show throughout the season, but for, you know there was some looky loos who were like, "Oh, that was really cool. That was a great first episode," and then maybe like it kind of fell off a little bit as it got weirder and and took its time getting to various plot reveals. And I think I thought was really cool about the finale was two things. Very, very often, especially in a like kind of post, I would say like House of Cards, like like Ozark world, like in the ever since like Netflix kind of came in and was like, you can do a prestige drama that people will binge in real time, basically. Mm-hmm. I feel like there's a tendency to empty the notebook every season, if not every episode. So basically any idea that you had for these this show. It all just gets crammed in there because we're trying to like make people's heads spin so fast that they're so addled they want to start the next episode. And this finale of Severance was probably the best season finale that I've seen in a long time because it was a season finale. Because it was like, we've wrapped up some things here. We haven't even wrapped it up. We've actually just like put our characters in a completely new dangerous position and it's like a legitimate cliffhanger. And I, it's been a while since I feel like I've seen something like that. The cliffhangers come, but a lot of the times I think you're almost like, is this kind of like a shadow series finale? Like, th- 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 and they didn't know if they were going to get renewed. And this felt like a lot of confidence that like we have kind of like an idea of where we're going. Yeah, we don't know necessarily if they had a kind of a back pocket season two renewal. Right. Um, that's something that is fairly common in the industry is that you get all assurances that you'll be back for season two without it being publicly announced. So it's possible that, you know, Dan Erickson and Ben Stiller, when they were putting the show together, were operating with a level of confidence that other showrunners can't operate with. That being said, incredible season finale. When I watched it last week, my wife, who doesn't really watch TV this way, not with the same kind of like analytical uh, strategy mind, turned to me and said, the pacing of this episode is incredible. Right. It's amazing how locked in I am right now on the show. And that's a testament to craft. I mean, it's like, it was just a really, really well-made show all the way through. I think it's reasonable if people felt like it lulled a little bit in the center. Most of these shows lull a little bit, but it was only eight episodes. So you didn't have to work that hard to get to the end of it. You know, I was always less interested in it as a puzzle box show and more so as like, um, an execution of style and theme. Yeah. Like I really loved the theme of the show and the concept of the show. And I really loved how it looked from second one. It was in that kind of like Gattaca polished sci-fi style that I love. So I was not like, I wasn't doing the thing that I thought Mal and Joe spoke so smartly about, which is like theories and diving deep on what, what does it all mean? mean? And yeah. yeah right, like right. I, I don't, I don't have that kind of brain. I'm not really good at that stuff. I much, I was just much more immersed in the world. And I really like the characters And that being said, I found myself getting wrapped up in all of that. Where is it going? Where is it going in that episode? Because that episode hurdles you forward into the hope of discovery. And then ultimately, whether we get any true discovery, I think is part of what makes it a great cliffhanger. But I I loved it. I thought it was a, a superb series. I'm fascinated to see how long it goes on for because it feels like a show that is made for three seasons. And I just wish that they would do three seasons and get away. Yeah, I there that anytime there's like a vaguely sci-fi mystery show like this, I think you have a little bit of like the orphan black danger where I don't know if you were 
a fan of Orphan Black's first season, but it was I, really I was. cool. Yeah. And then and then as soon as the second and third seasons or like later later seasons kicked in, it was like, oh, you guys are gonna get really lost in the self created mythology of this show. And lose some of the sort of energy that it had. And I think that that's like a, a, something that Severance really balanced well is like the 70s conspiracy thriller slash human drama stuff that I think Stiller obviously was very attracted to. And you can hear that even in the lonely piano score that plays, but very reminiscent of the, the conversation and stuff like that versus the mechanics of what's happening at Lumen, what these macro data refiners are, what, what, what are these numbers going to boxes mean? What's the result of these things? And I think that the questions I wound up asking were, were like much more character based than they were world building based. And that was exciting. So I was like, why are Mark, Helly, Irv and Dylan so important? You know, is it, it these, is this the only group that's important or, you know, obviously Helly infiltrated this group, why is that significant? Is it could it have been any group of macro data refiners, or was it something about Mark? Why is Kobol following Mark around and essentially shadowing him? Like there is like a lot of mystery still there, but it's almost like character to character mystery. Whereas you can also go in and Apple put up a book that's kind of like a tell all about Lumen that you can like read about some previous. Uh, whistleblowers on Lumen and how they were dealt with and some some stuff like that, which is really cool. Kind of reminds me of of the way people used to kind of spin additional stuff off of Lost. And and that was really neat. But I wanted to talk to you a little bit about Stiller. Like we mentioned the style of it. And he was talking in a couple of the interviews he did after uh, the finale where he was like, you know, everything for the first group of episodes for, the, for most of the season is pretty... Um, the camera's locked down, and if it moves at all, it's very, very deliberate. And he's like, that's why in the finale, it's all handheld. It's manically cross-cutting with like those blips happening as the cut goes between these people, kind of almost sort of trying to replicate what it's like to have your severed chip come back on. And you're right. I mean, it was a 40-minute episode. It's relentlessly paced and sneakily doesn't reveal that much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we didn't learn anything really except for a pretty significant reveal about Heli. Yeah. Um, which they had been kind of withholding from us in a very specific way that they were not withholding anything else. Stiller, what a fascinating guy. What a fascinating career he's having. You know, this this uh next month, I think, is the 10-year anniversary of this extraordinary Tad Friend profile of Stiller in the New Yorker, which came out synced to the secret life of Walter Mitty. I can't believe which, the secret life of Walter Mitty was 10 years ago. Uh, I know we we are we are truly dying slowly. Um, and you know, the Secret Life of Walter Mitty was a movie that I think was like highly anticipated, a kind of um, you know literary adaptation of a fantastical story. I think it's a Thurber story, mm -hmm. and uh, I would say it landed quietly. It was not a huge hit. It was not dissed or dismissed, but it was just kind of like okay, that was interesting, but kind of a miss. And it's a movie that I think has gained pretty significantly in reputation the more that people revisit it and i think if you look at that movie and you look at severance you can see like kind of the beginning of something for him he's always been a really interesting filmmaker and kind of comic creator and i think when people say his name they think of zoolander or, you know they think of dodgeball or something like that but he's a very very smart guy he's a very meticulous person that's in, you find that in every piece about him is that he is like obsessive about getting things right and this is a show that is obsessive about getting things right. Its characters need to get everything right. The company that is at the center of the story needs to get everything right. It feels like a perfect match for his idiosyncrasies as a creative person. I just, I, I, I kind of didn't really see it coming. Him kind of turning into one of the great directors of his time. I mean, you guys talked to him for Escape from Danamora yeah. on, when it was on Showtime, which was just a terrific show. I, I just talked to Ty West on the pod on the big picture a couple weeks ago and he cited Escape from Danamore too and he was just like Ben Stiller is super underrated man yeah Danamore seems like that was also Sam Esmail loved that like I feel like a lot of people who make TV look at Danamore as like a like a really significant achievement which I, I like the show quite a bit but I think it's like some of it's like drabness kind of got to me after a while but yeah like people people rock with him pretty heavily I feel like you can also feel Stiller recognizing in real time, and this is this is kind of the conceit of the Tad Friend piece, but kind of realizing that I can't 
be Derek Zoolander like in my 60s. And so what is going to speak to me creatively? Yeah. And so I need to find better and different kind of work to do. And I don't, I don't know. I mean, this is a really, really, really good show. Um, and it's a really unique show. And it's a little bit of a tough sell, I think, if you're not a fan of science fiction or you're not a fan of this kind of like stripped down storytelling. But I thought it was a really successful finale. I, I'd be happy to wait a year to get it back. I know a lot of people felt differently. I know a lot of people were like, I want it now. I need sure. to find out more stuff now. But I'm kind of the opposite with these sorts of stories. Like, I'd like to forget how much I liked it and then be reminded when it comes back. That being said, if we're, if I'm watching Severance in 2028 in like season six, I'm going to be annoyed. <laughs> I think that there's probably a happy medium where they do give us like a year. I Just as long as it's not like the two year wait, which obviously was COVID uh, created. But like this two year wait with like Barry, Stranger Things, um, Better Call Saul, where I'm like, shit, do I have to rewatch this series? <laughs> to remember yeah. what, what happened to these people. There's a couple of severance things I wanted to talk about, uh, specifically like just like little plot points. I will say, I think the second season has the potential to be even better because part of what I, you know, I thought that the early opening episodes were wonderful, but had a certain deliberate, this is what it's like for Mark to go from his home to work. And here's five shots of him driving and walking from the parking lot and sliding his ID card. And it creates that rhythm. But after a while, I was like, okay, got it. Like I've, I've established that it's cold there and that this is what happens every day. And I think that if you get into that second season and if the second season essentially starts the second Heli wakes up on stage from, or the, her Audi takes back over and the first episode of the second season is like what Helena is like, that's going to be awesome. And just to have that, I hope they keep some of the momentum going out of the finale rather than going back to like two months later and this is what's happening. And now there's like a mystery of what mm. happened in the interceding two months. I wanted to ask you some of the like plot point things. Sure. I have no, literally no insight and I, I don't understand. I don't understand expect it. you to, but I guess okay. I'm kind of curious about whether some of these plot points intrigue you more turn you off more or whatever. Like I think okay. the big, one of the big reveals towards the end of the season was this idea that Mark's wife, who he was mourning, he thought he was mourning who died in a car crash. And, uh, that was why he had opted for severance in the first place. Uh, was in fact, I don't know if alive is the right word, but at least there is a clone of her seemingly working at Lumen, but she's not quite like the other people working at Lumen in that she seems to be getting, uh, returned to some floor. I my 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 idea about this is that they are experimenting, obviously, with like regenerating people. Um, that would make sense, also, given the regard they hold Kier Egan in, you know, and like this idea that there are these like sort of totemic figures in the Egan family, and that the idea would be like bringing them back in some capacity. Did you find that part like? I, I, I guess what it does is essentially gives Mark like a different mission than before because now it's like, well, his wife is alive. So will his Innie and Audi both recognize the fact that this woman is Gemma? But what did you think of that sort of curveball thrown in there? It had me thinking differently about what Lumen is, which is that I, through the first three quarters of the season, I believed that Lumen actually did make something or yeah. produced something, or it was responsible to something. And then by the time we got the reveal about Miss Casey, it had me thinking that this is just the terrarium, that this is just a place where they're kind of actively experimenting, not just in regeneration, but in psychological experimentation on a, on a regular basis. And that the idea of putting someone who has been severed in the same space as either his wife or a clone of his wife, who is also severed and has no recognition, is like basically like a test of wills. It's like a test of psychological wills. And that is interesting. It's probably like a little bit less exciting because then ultimately what Lumen's motivations are, or like how they make money is maybe like less uh, world conquering. Mm -hmm. But the fact that they have politicians in their back pocket, the fact that Severance is expanding clearly outside of the world of Lumen that, you know, the, the, the politician's yeah. wife, you know, is clearly part of the part of the experience at this point i find really interesting i guess i don't really know it, what you're saying about where they can pick up is interesting right because they could just pick up exactly where they left off but they could also go back like 10 years into the past sure 
and just or 50 years into the past and show us like where Egan started, you know, and where Helly's grandfather, how he revolved or whatever the hell they're doing with, you know, like there, there is a lot of potential mythology there. So it'll, I'm curious to see where it shakes out. The politician thing is notable because PD and the politician and his wife and Mark's sister and brother-in-law who obviously the brother-in-law is essentially writes like the new Testament as far as Mark's concerned. And this mm-hmm. guy is just a, like, you know, an, an idiot. Uh, they're the the sort of band of the of the real world that's outside of Lumen. And I thought that the show was just as careful about how much of the real world they showed us as they were about what they showed us inside of Lumen. So it's notable that like we kind of get a sense that there it's like it's like our world, but not so much that it's like people are talking about the Mets, you know, or people are talking about like you know, Olivia Rodrigo, there's no like pop cultural or chronological references to what's going on in that world. It's just that there are people outside of it. I keep kind of going back to this, the similarities I saw in some of the stuff that like they're doing in this show with this um, Philip K. Dick novel called Time Out of Joint. Did you ever, did you ever happen to I've read that? I've never read it. So I only ever picked it up because it was uh, LP from Company Flow named a song after it, this novel on his uh record fantastic damage which still goes really hard and it's essentially you get it. this is important that you get into your uh <laughs> sci-fi influenced abstract Def rap Jux bag. Back rap. Yeah, yeah. yeah anyway this novel is about a guy whose life he's living in 1959 and every day he just gets up and he does uh a puzzle called find the little green men in the newspaper and he like wins this quiz this puzzle game and wins like a prize like every week and he has a pretty idyllic life in this small town, but there's like a couple of things different about this small town or this 1959 from the one that we know. Like in this 1959, there's no Marilyn Monroe and there are no radios. And there's just like these little differences. And it just becomes apparent over the course of the book that things are not what they seem. And the big twist, spoiler alert for anybody who wanted to read this novel, you can skip 10 seconds, is that this guy is in fact predicting attacks by a lunar, a rebel lunar colony on the moon who are dropping missiles on Earth. Mm. And it's 1998. It's 1998. And and it's like a Truman Show meets, you know, Total Recall kind of thing. Awesome book. Really reminds me of kind of like, what are they putting in these boxes in macro data refining? Like, are they they doing something that has like real world implications? Or is there actually just like, is it behavioral coaching? Like, well, can we get this person to do this for six years? It's possible. It's like those are the two extremes, right? Yeah, right. Like what I'm suggesting is that everything that they're doing is meaningless. And what you're suggesting is that everything that they're doing is utterly critical. And either answer is good. Yeah. I like I, I would be content with it. It's so funny though. Like I just don't. You don't think I, that's not how you think of these things. I'm, I'd never be a good TV podcast. You know what I mean? Like I just, <laughs> like I, I, I most appreciate things that end and I'm not good at theories. And perhaps it's because I'm not inherently creative, but I, love the idea of a show like this washing over me and turning myself over to the creators and not willing an outcome onto a creator. Oh, I, I have think no that's... vested interest in how no, this I, winds I up. Know. I was way more like that with True Detective. You know what I mean? Mm. Like, I think I, there have definitely been shows where I was like, we need to have a spaghetti bearded demon emerge out of Carcosa at the end of this. You know, it, <laughs> honestly, what it, it makes me think that because I have endured so much losing in rooting for my sports teams that I could not possibly conceptualize Get invested, in. yes, like correctly pushing for the right narrative to turn out. Like I just don't, I can't see it that way. But hey, look, I'm, I'm, I'm in. I'm on the journey. I love Severance. This episode is brought to you by Mint Mobile. New Year's resolutions are fun the first couple of weeks. Then you kind of maybe conveniently forget about them halfway through January. No shame. It happens to us all. But this year, I have a foolproof plan, at least when it comes to saving money. Just switch to Mint Mobile and you're done. Goal accomplished. Because for a limited time, their wireless plans are 15 bucks a month when you buy a three-month plan. The great thing about Mint Mobile is there's no jaw-dropping monthly bills or unexpected overages, and all plans come with unlimited talk and text. Get this new customer offer today at mintmobile.com slash watch. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. This episode is brought to you by State Farm. 
You might say all kinds of stuff when things go wrong, but these are the words you really need to remember. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. They've got options to fit your unique insurance needs, meaning you can talk to your agent to choose the coverage you need, have coverage options to protect the things you value most, file a claim right on the State Farm mobile app, and even reach a real person when you need to talk to someone. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Atlassian software like Jira, Confluence, and Trello help power global collaboration for all teams so they can accomplish everything that's impossible alone because individually we're great, but together we're so much better. That's why millions of teams around the world, including 75% of the Fortune 500, trust Atlassian software. Learn how to unleash the potential of your team at Atlassian.com. That's A-T-L-A-S-S-I-A-N.com. Atlassian. You don't have to buy custom window treatments in person because Blinds.com invented a better way. Blinds.com is 100% online. There's no showroom markups or waiting hours for quotes from pushy salespeople. A Blinds.com designer helped me pick the perfect style for free. And Blinds.com shipped free samples right to my door. You can DIY or book a pro like I did with just one click. Best of all, everything's covered with the Blinds.com 100% satisfaction guarantee. Shop Blinds.com for up to 45% off. Rules and restrictions may apply. So you mentioned this. I wanted to ask you a little bit about the dropout, which also ended last week, I believe. And uh, I think was my favorite of the ripped from the headlines, ripped from the podcast shows. And one thing that all of these shows sort of share is a kind of like, you already know this story. We're just going to put like gray actors or, you know, maybe you don't know this story, but you've already read or listened to a version of these events that is pretty, you know, pretty straightforward, but also pretty all encompassing. So what we're here to do is put the most interesting actors in these roles and maybe find some moments of human drama that you you could only experience on TV. For some reason, like I'm, I, I don't really care about Elizabeth Holmes, but found Seyfried absolutely like gangbusters amazing. What a run she's on between Mank and this. I hope that this is the beginning of her having like a 10 year run of like, just give her the Meryl Streep roles, like give her the, the money roles. Uh, what did you, what did you think of the finale? I thought it was really good that it didn't give up the ghost on Elizabeth Holmes's psychological state of mind. The the show never let you think for a second that she felt like she was grifting anyone. And she wasn't scamming people that she had convinced herself in this almost like overwhelmingly all-encompassing psychosis Mm -hmm. that she was doing something good, that her company was doing something good, and that she taught herself this at the age of 19 when she came up with this concept and that she never let herself believe anything otherwise. Now, obviously, Seyfried's performance betrays something without saying the opposite, and that's part of what makes it such a good performance. But we've never heard Elizabeth Holmes say, I was wrong and I got way in over my head or any, she never has, she's never spoken about this in that way. And so it, it was this fascinating journey into like the mind of a sociopath. I mean, she really was, Yeah, she inflicted a lot of fascinating damage on people. There was obviously some severe medical consequences for people, which the end, that end card kind of notes the people who basically got their day in court were actually the investors. Those are the people who um, got retribution for Holmes's and Balwani's actions. The story itself was never very interesting to me either. I have watched a couple of documentaries about it. I was familiar with it going in. So it's kind of the inverse of the severance conversation we were just having. But I just was fully invested in where Seifert took the character, which is to say like to the, to the bottom. I mean that, that primal scream that she lets out when she's waiting for a car to pick her up near in that final episode is like somebody who just truly lost it all. I did think that the, that sequence where she's walking through the empty office with her lawyer was like a little bit of a stretch, a little bit of a, like an overwritten, I'm just going to hammer home this theme for you in case you didn't realize what they were doing here. Cause we knew, you know, we spent enough time in that world, but, um, I was consistently impressed with the show throughout. I, I think it, it held its tone and when it needed to be funny, it was funny. And when it needed to be really kind of scary and gripping, it was really scary and gripping. And I think the other thing is that like, she is maybe I might be ripping this concept off from you, 
and a conversation that you had with Joanna, but like the stakes were a little higher on the show, I thought, than say on We Crashed. Right. Um, and the, what they were sought out to do was a bigger swing. And there was something kind of like more, it wasn't as culturally profound because it didn't touch as many people, but it was biologically and humanistically more profound. And so that's why I felt like worthy of this kind of a story. Yeah. I mean, I think that this is a really like a, this show more than uh, more than almost anything I've seen this year is kind of a masterpiece in tone because I was very, very skeptical about whether or not you could bring any of like Liz Merriweather's sensibilities together with Liz Hanna's and Michael Showalter's and have this very like, would it Cypher be able to do something that wasn't like, a really long SNL sketch, you know, and, and would you be able to kind of get over the voice and the turtleneck and the, that element of it? And I thought exactly what you said, like an old white man with rock and everybody, it's like got these incredible comic moments. There is like a psychological terrorism to the codependency between Sonny and Elizabeth throughout this series where it's like creepy, it's domineering. It's they, they like, that's like a very, very like, sophisticated relationship dramatically in terms of the way they write those two characters and the ways in which those two characters keep each other tethered, but also punish one another, you know, mm-hmm. throughout. <laughs> and, you know, like the bench of this show is almost absurd. Like Ann Archer just saying, let him finish George five times is, it seems, I'm just like, where's Ann Archer been? And is that really all we have? But like when you have Ann Archer and Sam Waterston doing old person one and two with Dylan Minnette, it's going to, it just has like a different resonance than if it, I don't know. I thought it was just an excellently conceived and executed show. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, it's, it's kind of the ideal for what you want from these kinds of shows. It's still so bizarre how they all rolled out simultaneously and whether or not like the engagement is lower on those shows is kind of fascinating to me. Yeah. It's, you know, I think you guys might have talked about, say, like uh, Andy made reference, I think, to the two Prefontaine movies that came out once upon a time. There was usually like a winner when that would, something like that would happen or like Armageddon and Deep Impact, like Deep Impact did good business, but Armageddon is the one that everybody loves and the one that did better yeah. at the box office. The dropout feels like the one that everybody critically agrees is, you know, the the very best. I, I'm, I'd love to know, actually, what was the most watched. We'll never find out, but um, <laughs> it, it it is, um, it also just feels like it will probably do pretty well at the Emmys. When, yes. When the Emmys well, I think around. that's also the answer for why all this stuff came out at the same time is just crashing it into the Emmys and getting Anne Hathaway and Amanda Seyfried their their Emmy nominations and getting Leto an Emmy nomination and all this stuff where it's just like I can't believe this is like all happening at once. It, I think that they all want the the awards run, but I you know we'll see. Seyfried is such a fascinating figure too because you know you mentioned Mank and she really has transformed herself into one of the best actresses of her generation. Yeah. And I, you know, in 2004, she was in Mean Girls and she was Lily Kane on, on Veronica Mars. Mm-hmm. And I always thought she was very striking. You know, she has those big kind of like cartoon eyes yeah. and this willowy voice. And she was always playing like kind of dumb, but maybe secretly smart. That was kind of her, her metier. And she looks almost exactly the same. Yes. Like 20 years later, like she has not really aged that much. So it's not about her presentation, but she's just so skilled now as an actor, you know, she's a way more subtle performer and I'll be, I'm so curious to see like what kind of a career she wants to have. Cause it feels like if you're an Oscar nominated actor and you win an Emmy, you can kind of write your ticket now. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm interested. There's, um, you know, when this, when, when you sort of first started seeing movie stars coming into TV, I guess it really started with with Trudy you know, and and those guys kind of like arriving and then you know Nicole Kidman and the Big Little Lies crew doing it and Sharp Objects and you see Amy Adams doing it and it, I think that there was something where it was a little bit of like a late middle age actors retirement fund you know mm-hmm. like where it was like did you because so you can't really do franchises anymore or maybe you can't like open a movie but you're a big star but like it's really cool but like ultimately I think that they started taking like these very uh, meaty roles in in TV. And the thing that's cool about the Seifert role or the Seifert performance is like, this is like a really good argument for why TV like this should exist is because they just don't have, there's not a movie where she could do this right now. Like, and if there is, there's like one a year 
And so everybody in Hollywood would go for the role, you know? She was in a movie in 2020 called You Should Have Left, which was a kind of like horror psychological yeah, thriller Kevin Bacon, that David right? Kep yeah. wrote and directed. And then she was in a movie on Netflix in 2021 called Things Heard and Seen, which was written and directed by uh, Sherry Springer Bergman and Robert Polcini, who made like mm-hmm. American, American Splendor. And those are some really talented people who all made those movies. I think both of those movies are considered kind of misses or people haven't really heard of them. And so she's like, she's obviously out there questing to make good stuff and to yeah. work with talented people. But like you say, movies are actually not really where it's at for the most part for an actor like her. And the fact that she would it surprise you at all if she just took on another miniseries immediately after that? Not at all. Wouldn't, wouldn't, you know, it seems like that could be where she goes. The Meryl Streep comp that you made before is kind of funny, right? Because Meryl Streep began as this deeply serious actress. And then she pivoted over time to a kind of like a serious comedy and then a kind of light comedy. Yeah. And it feels like Amanda Seyfried is maybe doing the inverse, you know, like her work is getting more and more serious as she gets older and becomes more skilled. But you know, she's also in Mamma Mia. I mean, she's like, (laughs) sure. She's, she's a really successful comic actress. So world is her oyster, I guess. Yeah. Like Elizabeth Holmes. Who's who she's, she's not in a good spot. Yeah. She doesn't have any oysters. Um, all right. Would you, would you wait, 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 before you wrap up, I have two really important questions. Would I touch my blood in Theranos? Would you have invested in Theranos if you were uh, part of that initial round? Uh, I'm not entirely positive. I'm not invested in Theranos. Like, do you know what I, you know what I mean? It's like sometimes do you ever like make a contribution to various like finance. Like you're like, okay, here's like my here's my money, and then they're like, no, we got Chris, you. I'm, I'm tremendously thorough in all my. Dealings so you have like a Bloomberg with, terminal up right now. Is that why you I look do. distracted? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm uh, wor- I'm just worried. Like sometimes I'm like I hope I'm not. Like I hope I don't have like a ton of Lockheed Martin stock. You know. You should look into that. <laughs> It is something well, you can you actually say look up pretty quickly. Fund. Doesn't that mean like you're kind of all over the place, right? Well, are you just like deeply invested in defense contracts? Is that <laughs> is that the fund that you says <laughs> emerging markets? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, okay, wait, wait, one one more question. Yeah, one more question. I, blood testing is something where I'm like, it seems like we do that pretty well. Okay, um, you know, I don't think we needed to like like optimize it. I'm sure I'm wrong, but like that was one of those things where I'm like, did we need to like? I understand getting it faster. But it's like, that was like, I was like, we could have seen this was a scam from the beginning. Second question, would you sever? Here's the thing. I talked about this a while back with Andy and I was like, I was like, I'm, I'm down to do it. I think it okay. would be interesting. I thought it was fascinating that with the Mark character, he's trying to escape pain in his personal life by going to work. You're a trying to escape people, the pain of, of working, movie drafts of yeah, me. Of, <laughs> no, but I wonder, like, I, I wonder where the, like, pe- it, it is the inverse of what most people think where it's like, man, my work is really hard. I'd love to forget about my work mm-hmm. and go home and enjoy my life. But most of these people, by the, by the depiction of Irv and Mark, at least, seem very sad and lonely in their personal lives. You know what I mean? So it's like, yes. I, I, I'm, I'm just wondering about like the, the flow of, of severed energy. Right. Would, you wouldn't sever though. You love your work and you love your home life. You want it well, to just inform itself. That, that's true. I do actually, I like that. But, but what you're saying to me right now is that you have a deep and satisfying home life, <laughs> but your work kind of blows. No, you and know so you want to be, be able to check out. Here's the thing. I know you're trying to bust you, my chops. You and I have been working closely together for 10 you know years. So this is a reflection of is me. If you severed and when you got out of severance, like you were just like, I guess I'll go to a movie. What's this? Uh, <laughs> the Sonic the Hedgehog looks pretty good. There's nothing wrong with seeing Sonic the Hedgehog. Too. I know, but nothing like, if you were like, and you were like, what are all these Blu-rays doing here? Maybe I should sever. <laughs> I'll look into it. I'll look into it. I would never you should do that. sever. And then when you come, like your severed self should be like, get super into TV theories <laughs> and solving mystery box shows. That should be your new thing. Uh, Sean, I'm going to let you go. Thank you so much for, for joining me today. Thank you so much for talking about severance. Everybody can hear us on the big picture and they can hear Sean on the big picture twice a week, as well as the rewatchables and the T- prestige TV podcast. And I'm sure elsewhere getting in there with just talking about DeGrom's elbow. Is that happening? Can you not bring up the Mets? Philly. Mets Phillies this week. They're mashing. Let's go. You ready? Yeah. Let's Chris sever ben- and become fans of the opposite team. Maybe you can be a Phillies fan for the weekend. I, I wish I could do that for Christ's sake. Chris, <laughs> thanks for having me on. You know, I think this is a great pod. Thanks, I think Ka- Kaya does amazing work on this she show. Does. She does. And uh, She'll be I love Andy. I miss Andy. This. I ever miss Andy too.
When's Andy I'm, I'm worried back? that he just likes England too much. Wow. Tough beat for you. All right. Thanks, buddy. Later, man.